Oh, where's Dylan? Hey, Dylan, if you're on the line, um, I need to be able to share my screen. Shelly, you should be good to share your screen though. Okay. You are the master. Thank you so much. No problem. What are we going to call HR at home when we're not at home anymore? Oh, Vicky, Vicky, Vicky. It's going to be a long time that we're at home. <laughs> I'm trying HR, to be optimistic. HR at home and other, you know, but, but it's interesting. We should maybe have this as a, maybe I have an idea for another, another session. Um, I think How a lot of people, HR anywhere? I think HR, I think a lot of people are going to be remote forever now. I think companies right, really think, rethinking their strategy. Um, so we'll see. And I did get a, I did get an email this morning. Um, for people saying maybe we could stick around after um, we'll have to plan this for next week. Um, and I think our Zoom lets us put people in private rooms, right? People want to network a little bit. So we have to maybe give that some thought for uh, the weeks to come. Okay. I, can, we can, we can, we I don't know it. how to do that. Me Dylan neither. Probably does. That's what we need Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this is week eight. I know. I think I may have told you this, Vicky. I was on a call the other day. I think the platform is called Remio or Remo, where you could see like, it looked like a, um, a blueprint of like a banquet hall and you could just double click on the table and join the people at that table and you could just jump around and network. It was really cool. Huh. I might get a picture of networking, by the way, if we can't have more than 20 of my people in a room. Let's see, we're still early, okay. Deb Kaufman is back. Hey, return of Deb Kaufman. Well, I was just, uh, uh, you know, as out and about as one can be from their home doing uh, other things. So uh -huh. I was a late registrant. I was actually interviewing this afternoon as a volunteer interviewing with Year Up students. Um, oh, I'm doing that next week. Yeah. What a great program. Year oh, Up. good. Yeah. No, it good. really, it, talk about technology. I mean, it was pretty good because you, know, you were in open rooms and they, they virtually paired, what, 40 students to somebody? It was great. Wow. great call. Oh, that's great. We got lots of people still dialing in here. It looks like they're... And just for the record, I wasn't drinking wine in front of the students. I just poured it as soon as I got off, okay? This is no, a no judgment zone, Deb. You're I'm fine. Just saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> this is not when we're going to start. Hmm. We got lots of new faces today, so this is great. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Hello.
I have just four o'clock, but I can still see there's folks coming into the call. So we're just gonna wait a few minutes. We had, as you might imagine, the most registrants we've had so far in eight weeks for this call today. So thank you so much for joining and just hang tight for another minute or two. No pressure, Jamil. <laughs> Everyone's here for you, Jamil. That's okay. You'll, you'll know how I did based on the drop off between this week and next. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're, we're already expecting that. That's nice. Some nice messages coming in chat. Awesome. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Welcome to HR at Home week eight. We were just saying how it's really hard to believe we've been doing this for eight weeks already and doing this remote for, I don't know, 11 or 12 or 13, <laughs> I forget. Um, but glad to see everybody. Uh, I am Shelly Azen. Um, and just to recap for everybody what were the purpose of this call um, that we created a couple of weeks ago was to really give us all as an HR community an opportunity to stay connected. You know, under normal circumstances, we would be at networking events and having happy hour in the city or going to PSPS events or SHRM events. And without that, we thought what a great way for us to all stay connected. So thank you so much for joining. Um, we always start off with a few legal updates by Keith Black. So he'll give us any updates regarding anything COVID related from a legal perspective. And then super, super excited to have um, as part of our, what we're calling sharing best practices, our guest speaker today, Jamil Rush who is a director of diversity and is going to share with us um, some of his experiences and learnings and best practices for all to, for us all to take back to our uh, uh, sorry organization. So Jamil, really glad to have you and, and thank you for making time for us on such short notice. And of course, it is happy hour, so beverages are optional. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Keith to get us started on legal updates. All right. Thanks, Shelley. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Glad to see such a great number. Um, I'm going to spend just a real quick quick time on this so we don't detract from uh, the main purpose of today's call, but most of you are probably aware that on June 5th, the uh, Payroll Protection Program Flexibility Act was signed into law, and it's just a way to provide some relief to employers who took advantage of the PPP loans. So um, a few main features of it, uh, in the past, only 25% of the loan funds were able to be spent on non-payroll, that's bumped up to 40%. Uh, in addition, um, we've moved the, the amount of time uh, from eight weeks to 24 weeks to use the funds. And the maturity of the loan uh, was increased from two years to a minimum of five and potentially more. So it just provides some relief for some organizations and, and businesses who got the money and uh, for you know quarantine reasons or, or other reasons weren't able to really use it uh, appropriately or to its fullest extent in the timeframes provided. So uh, just a little good news there. Uh, other than that, not really anything else to report this week on on the COVID legal front. So that's that's short and sweet legal program today. Wow, that was the quickest update we've had thus far. Yeah, well, I wanted, I wanted to get to the main. I know. Here. Any any updates or excuse me, any questions for Keith? Remember, we can always use the chat feature. You also have the ability to take yourself off mute if you have any questions. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Keith to introduce uh, better than I did our guests for today. Oh, great. Thanks, Sean. It is my extreme pleasure and honor to welcome Jamil Rush with us today. Jamil is uh, AVP and Chief Diversity Officer at Aramark, uh, one of the, the landmark Philadelphia organizations. And he's also, I'm proud to say, a colleague of mine in the uh, HRD Master's Program at Villanova, where he's an instructor in diversity and inclusion. And um, he's also an adjunct professor at Temple in the undergrad level. Um, and, you know, Jamil was kind enough to spend some time with us today to, to try to, to start a dialogue and begin 
uh, an uncomfortable conversation for a lot of people, but how can HR really make a difference? How can HR uh, in an organization help move the needle <clears throat> in some of these issues involving um, anti-racism and social justice? So we're, we're hoping to have a very dynamic discussion with all of you today. Um, you're all welcome to unmute yourselves and, and ask questions. Um, we're gonna start, I'm gonna have Jamil introduce himself just a little bit more. And then we have a couple questions to get kicked off and a few that were sent in by folks in advance. And then uh, after that, we're really opening the floor for um, what, what I'm hoping is really a rich, rich discussion on um, what can we do beyond talk. Um, so with that, Jamil, if you wanna say a few words about yourself, um, other than what we've shared so far, then we'll get, get into a couple questions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Keith, Shelley, and, and the team. Thanks for having me on. And thank you all for um, jumping on to, to discuss this really important topic. Uh, I told Shelley and Keith in our, our prep call and Vicki as well, just how important this is to me on many different levels as an HR practitioner, as a black male, as a DNI person, right? So the, the, the current moment and the movement that is associated with it is so core and important to who I am within my DNA. Um, as Keith said, uh, my role is leading the diversity and inclusion team for Aramark, which is a large food facilities and uniform services um, company based locally here in Philadelphia. Uh, all said, I've been with Aramark for just about a decade, somewhere around 10 years. Um, I'm actually a boomeranger, so I, I was with the organization uh, for somewhere around eight and a half years, left for three and a half years to work for a com another company locally here in Philadelphia uh, called Day and Zimmerman, which is down on Spring Garden Street, for those of you who know the city well. Uh, and then I've been back in this role with the organization for just a, just over a year, a year and a, and a few months change. So I've had the pleasure of coming back to a time where we get COVID, um, probably one of the, the largest national unrest um, uh, movements that we've seen in some years within our country and globally. Uh, and really excited to talk to you all about this work around what we're doing and hopefully start the dialogue around ways that we can continue to move the needle forward as a function. I will also caveat it, this all with, right, my role as a DNI practitioner and I don't act like I am uh, an expert in social justice and um, a, a sociologist by any means. Um, I do study this, I read this and I, and I try to live it day and day day in, day out, and I try to talk from my personal experiences. But if there are things I don't know, I'll tell you all I don't know it. I won't try to make up questions for you. Uh, so just bear with me if I just say I don't know, but I, I will try to make sure that if anything comes up that I can give you perspective on, that I at least try to point you in the right direction. So. Also, Ariad, yeah, this is moving constantly, and we've not seen this before. Um, we've seen similar movements, but certainly this is one of the largest scales ones we've seen. So also these answers are subject to change as we learn more and we get a better picture of what this means for us in corporate America um, and how we better support uh, our Black and African American community members. Great. Thank you so much. So I think, you know, this is a, this is a really meaningful day in this movement in Philadelphia, having 110, 120 local HR leaders signed up for this call to have this discussion. Uh, says a lot, I think, about how passionate people in our local area are about wanting to make a change. So what are your thoughts, Jamil, on how we could be guiding our organizations as HR leaders to respond to the death of George Floyd and the overall movement related to anti-racism and social justice? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a few layers that we need to be thinking about right off the bat for our organizations to take action off, take action on. Um, the first is you need to be hyper conscious that this cannot be an HR initiative, right? Like it's not HR's job to fix racism. That, that's not your role. This is something that the organization top down needs to be committed to and, and ready to have a dialogue about. Um, one of the things that you'll need to make sure that you're taking care of is how is this impacting your employees personally, uh, both your uh, Black and African American employees, and also your non-Black employees who are sort of experiencing this and working through what this means for them. Um, the second is how are you educating your organization? So how are you starting to provide guidance and education on what the next steps are? Um, certainly for those who want to take action, for those who want to see things better within the company that they're working for, but also in the world more broadly. And then what are the larger commitments, which I, I'm, we'll talk about a little bit more, Keith, but I think a lot of this 
the pop and circumstance that we're seeing is really important and we need CEO statements and we need public rebukes of um, injustice and calls for equity. All those things are critical to, to put on the right face and show the right direction that we're headed in. Um, but the reality is that it's going to need to turn quickly from that to substance. Um, and what does that mean for your community impact and what does that mean? So the first thing for HR leaders, if your CEO has not already spoken about this to your organization, um, at least internally, if not internally and externally, you got to talk about it. Um, it, it literally, it, I, I wish I had a percentage of the number of Fortune 500 companies that have seen that have sent something out, the number of mid-sized companies that have sent something out, and I think even more of our small businesses have, have been vocal in this front. Um, but you got to make sure that your senior most leaders are giving voice to this issue and talking about what it means for the organization and making some at least calls of support early on. Um, and then the second one is what are those support systems that, are, that you're setting up? So how are you helping people to deal with the emotional impact of it? I think there's a unique experience that you'll see from your black uh, and brown employees uh, around how they're dealing with just the grief associated with the killing of black Americas and injustice, um, how they're dealing with the trauma um, that, that might be coming out of that. But I think there's also an experience that you see from your non-Black employees that you need to be setting them up. Now, whether that's coordinated sessions that you have internally with your organization, leveraging counseling services from your EAP, uh, you just really need to get hyper-focused on, hey guys, here's how we're gonna support you through this moment. And here's how we're gonna make sure that your, your mental well-being is protected. Uh, and then the third um, piece really needs to get into education and, and teaching around what real allyship looks like. Um, so how are you starting to put together messaging and training and facility discuss facilitated discussions and um, all those pieces that help give guidance to what that allyship really looks like? Um, I know many of you have asked this question. I know many of you have received these questions of like, what can I do? I, I didn't realize how big of a problem this is. You know, I'm passionate. I want to make a difference. What do I really do about that? Um, and I think we as HR leaders and as organizations can help to answer that question. So we can say, here's what we're going to do within our space and our con control, whether that's through charitable, charitable contributions, direct volunteerism, leadership development within your company or organization. There's a multitude of levels, but helping to direct that energy of what I can do that people are asking right now is going to be really important. Something you said struck a chord. Um, I, I read the other day. Uh, on LinkedIn, someone had posted that um, saying I'm an ally doesn't cut it. Um, it's practicing allyship that we need to do. And uh, I think you kind of alluded to that too just now. Do, do you have any specific examples or specific actions that we could take that would be affirmatively practicing allyship? Yeah. So I think they're macro and uh, micro in terms of what actions uh, you can take. The, the first is at an individual level, educate yourself. Um, real, I think a lot of really well-intended individuals are putting pressure back on their Black employees to be the ones to educate them on what it means to be an ally. So when you go to your Black employees and say, like, tell me what I can do, um, it sort of puts the onus back on them to say, teach me how to be better. Uh, it really goes a long way when you, when you come to the conversation with a certain level of work and foundational knowledge that you can see on your, see on your own. Um, one of the benefits of all of this is like you can just Google right now how to be an anti-racist um, social injustice uh, in thought leaders around the world are just pulling together resources all over the place to just say what are the key books to read right now um, to learn about the injustices that are faced inside of America. Uh, what does allyship look like sort of getting a certain foundation of self knowledge is going to be really critical so that when you go into these conversations of what can I do it's not you tell me it's, here's what I'm thinking, here's what I think it's worth, can you give me perspective on whether or not that'll really hit the mark? So it just changes that onus and it puts that onus on yourself as the ally to do the work versus the onus on others to do the work for you. So I think that's one from a, sort of like a self, um, what can I do specifically towards it? Um, I think the other piece is how do you start to become vocal in this space and how do you use those really small moments to help teach others 
uh, I think, I'm sure many of you have heard this and through all the social media memes and, and people are just talking, right? It's not enough to just not be racist, right? You gotta be an anti-racist uh, and take an, an active role in combating racism. So how are you making sure that the communities around you are um, speaking about and creating opportunities for people of color in an equitable fashion? Uh, it's going to be really important. How do you make sure that there's no use of language and if people don't feel comfortable saying things that aren't okay in your presence? Um, and how do you create those safe spaces within your organization is going to be really important. Uh, and then I think you also just need to decide for yourself, like, where are you going to play um, inside of this space? Are you going to make a difference within your company? Fantastic. Are you going to make a difference within your household? Fantastic. Are you going to be in the streets marching with people? That's great as well. But I think you need to decide how large you personally want to play a role as an ally and then start to make the commitment on what actions follow up there. Great. And we've seen, as you mentioned, largely positive responses, messages from leaders, from CEOs, from organizations. Um, that won't be universal, as you know, and as all of us will experience. Is there, um, when we approach how do we approach potential resistance that we may see from organizations or from individual leaders within organizations uh, to this movement that we're, we're all working towards? Um, I will say it's, it's easier to deal with individuals than it is sort of systemic issues across your work. So if it's a top-down approach of saying like, this isn't something we're passionate about or that we care about, um, I think giving the resources and the guidance and the why uh, both beyond why it's the right thing to do, but also the business impact, right? We, we can look right now and read the news from this morning. There's a, a major CEO that had to step down uh, because he wasn't saying the right things. And there's been nothing but social media posts of people who have been fired because they're on people's comments saying very racist things, racist things that are getting back to the organization and those people are being suspended, fired, all the like. So, you know, I think there's a talent impact of, uh, you're being held accountable in a different way and people are really making decisions with their dollars. Uh, we saw some of that from Papa John's a couple of years ago as they were dealing with the, the fallout from their organization and um, they took a real financial hit for not talking about this work in the right way and not being on the right side of it and, and holding leaders accountable. So I think really talking about the business impact related to it, uh, both through people who are making decisions about the types of organization that organizations that they want to patronize, the types of types of organizations that they want to be associated with, um, clients and customers, the types of organizations that they want to be associated with as well. So bringing that business case and that business impact is always critical, not just for this moment, but all for everything we do from a diversity and inclusion um, standpoint. Um, and then I think as you get deeper into the organization, it, once you get that top uh, CEO, senior leader, buy-in, if you get individual resistance. I think it's really important that that message of why this is a critical moment and what's acceptable and not acceptable within your organizations, that that doesn't always come from HR. Um, I think you need to get those senior leaders to lean on the people within their organizations. So it's one thing for your CEO to send out a message. It's another thing for your CEO to um, have direct communications with those who aren't getting involved and saying, like, no, I don't support this. I don't want my team members to spend any time with this allyship training. I think it's a waste of time. I don't think racism is a thing inside of our company. To have those conversations happen through those senior leaders and not just through HR is going to be really important. Um, and that's one way that you can go to your leaders to say, what are you doing to be an ally? You can help to use your influence towards others. And we talk about privilege and the power that's associated with it, um, which I'm happy to have a dialogue with as well. But how do you use your power and influence to actually influence and drive change. Right. And you referenced earlier that this really can't be something that HR drives. Um, it has to be driven by the leadership. Um, is there anything though, speaking specifically of HR and the role that we as a profession can play, is there anything in particular that you'd like to see or that you could see us doing to help move the needle and to help drive that change? Yeah, um, I think there's a few things. I think one is you have a lot of leaders who are really passionate about this and they they believe it and they want to be supportive, um, but they just don't know what to say. Uh, and for fear of saying the wrong things, they say nothing. Um, so I think there's a lot, a large role that we play in HR at just giving leaders the language that they can use, helping them be vulnerable with us as HR practitioners and DNI practitioners, 
so that they can work through their thoughts and feelings so that when they're, um, so to speak, on stage and they're really, it's the moment of truth with their teams, they kind of work through their thought process in a way that they can be authentic and transparent and, and come across as meaningful. So helping to coach and guide our leaders through their thought processes. I think we ourselves as HR leaders need to be really educated and well-versed on the issues of um, not just systemic racism, injustices and inequities that are existing within our companies, but also diversity and inclusion is at a large uh, and what that means and why it's important for our businesses to thrive. So we need to um, be leaders ourselves. I think we also need to challenge ourselves as an HR community um, and lead the way. It's hard to talk to our, our leaders and say like, you need to be to value diversity, you need to get better representation within your teams, if that doesn't exist within our own HR teams as well. Um, so I think there's a personal challenge that we has, is, have as HR practitioners to walk the walk that we're challenging our, our, our leaders to walk as well. Um, so that there's a bit of introspection to just say like, do we have representation within our team as an HR function? Do we have the right procedures in place to make sure that we are enabling um, diverse talent to get through the door, that we have equitable practices within our succession planning and talent management systems? How are we making sure that we have all those, that our shop is in order while we're challenging others to do the same? I want to circle back to a comment you made a couple minutes ago about using, using your power and privilege for good. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, and I think this is really important because privilege has become such a charged word. And in particular, when we talk about white privilege, I think people give like a very visceral reaction to it. And it, it's sort of like, well, things are hard for me too. Um, so I, I think it's really important that we understand what, we, what we're talking about when we use privilege. And it's not exclusive to white people. It, it's really, it's a term that's used for the majority within a population. Um, and at its simplest level, it, it means that when we talk about privilege, it's that this insert X thing about you is not something that you need to worry about uh, as you're navigating life, career, all the like. So um, when we talk about white privilege, it's really about this idea that your race and ethnicity isn't something that you need to worry about um, in terms of it impacting the way that you show up at work. We talk about male privilege, right? Like, so we talk about as a man that I get certain um, benefits of the doubt afforded to me that uh, my women and female identifying colleagues don't get, right? We talk about straight privilege and you don't, as a, as a cisgender, cisgender straight person, I don't have to worry about talking about my family and how that might be perceived or received from the others around us. So privilege doesn't mean that um, life is free of obstacles and it was easy for you and you just could have like walk through daisies to get to the place where you are. Um, privilege is that this one space about who you are as an individual hasn't presented an additional obstacle to life. So understanding that privilege is really important for us individually and understanding the privileges that we have, uh, because one of the things that privilege affords us is we don't have to notice how insert demographic here impacts others. So literally it does not exist for us. Uh, and the best example I can use uh, that I think becomes really tangible uh, so we talk about able-bodied privilege, right? If you are someone who does not have a physical disability, when you walk into a new space, you're not worried about, do they have handicap accessible ramps? Is there an elevator to get to the spot that I would need to get into? Um, what's the seating going to look like when I get there, right? Like I have an able-bodied privilege that I legit, for the most part, have no idea and do no research whatsoever on whether or not a place that I'm going provides me those types of opportunities, right? So that's my able-bodied privilege. The same thing exists for other communities. So um, for those of us who might not identify as Black, we don't know the, the circumstances and the um, unique challenges that Black employees face. Same thing with male, female, right? As men, we don't know the unique challenges and circumstances and biases that our, our female, colleagues might, female colleagues might have to endure. So I think it's really important that that message of, hey, this is a challenge for me and my race and ethnicity is creating an additional challenge inside of this workspace, that that message just doesn't come from the people who are um, speaking up for themselves, right? It feels a little bit self-serving because it is and should be when people are saying like, hey, for me, I need you to make a better um, space for me. There's a certain power that comes from advocates and allies stepping up to say, no, I don't have that experience, but 
I am listening and I'm hearing and I want to make sure that that person's feelings are validated and I'm going to use the privilege that comes from me not identifying in that group to give voice and echo the sentiments that are coming from uh, this other group. So I think you, there's power that comes from being in the majority and there's validation that comes from others in the majority giving voice to those who are marginalized and what they're trying to say. I don't know if that made sense, Keith. You can let yeah, me know. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head, though, um, you know, especially with a lot of the friction that comes from the term privilege is a lack of understanding and something that education can fix. And I know, you know, I'll freely admit the first time I heard it, I got a little defensive because I think anyone, when you're told you have some privilege, you kind of get a little bit like, yeah. what are you talking about? When I understood it, it made it completely different. And I think we have a similar issue with Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter. Um, you know, at first blush, a lot of people's first response is, well, all lives matter, but that's not the point. And you still see people taking that approach and they don't get it, they don't understand it. And I think so much of it is education and being able to help people understand. And granted, not everyone will, we know that, but um, it's such a big part. And I think to your point earlier, that is a big part that we can play as HR is the education of our employees, of our workforce, and helping them understand what a lot of this really means. And maybe that'll help with some of that acceptance of issues. And also realizing just because you don't see it, that doesn't mean it's not happening, right? Yeah. Just because it's not your experience, that doesn't mean it's not happening. And that's the, the nature of privilege to go back to that able-bodied example. Just because I don't see whether or not there are um, a, a handicap accessible things, that doesn't mean I know whether or not they exist, right? So giving voice and listening to people and validating and saying like, hey, can you talk to me about that? How's that showing up? How can I really take action upon it so that we can um, behave in a better fashion? Yeah, it really highlights empathy, I think. Yeah. Um, if you're good, we'll move on to a couple of the questions that were sent in by uh, some of our participants in advance. Go for it. And then, uh, then we'll open it up to, to any discussion. Uh, first question was, uh, Jamil, is there any advice or feedback on how to inspire a more direct focus on diversity initiatives in a large organization? Yeah, I, I think it's really critical. Um, one challenge we often have from a DNI standpoint is um, approaching diversity solely from the it's the right thing to do conversation. Uh, and it is, and I think that's critical and we need to make sure that's front and center. Um, I think the reality is also that there's a really firm, clear, the research and evidence is clear around the business case around why diversity drives better outcomes within our organizations. Um, and when you come to leaders talking to them about, hey, look how diverse organization out outperform um, their homogenous peers, um, look how this gives us better access to this consumer base. Uh, this opens up spin categories. Look at these examples of companies that have done this really well and it's opened up a wealth of opportunities. So I think it's really like anything that else that we do, having conversations around the business case and the financial impact is gonna be really critical. And then the icing on the cake is, you know, by the way, it's the right thing to do um, at the same time. So that becomes uh, almost secondary, but um, not the primary focus of it. Right now, honestly, people are going to be passionate about it. I think we have a unique opportunity and a unique window to talk about the importance of diversity and inclusion um, because right now people are hyper-focused on it and they're sensitive and they're, they're worried about public perception. Um, so I think it's important that we sneak into this window really intently about saying, here's what we need to do specifically for our Black employees. And then, oh, by the way, once we get this down, here's what we just need to do more broadly as it re relates to being a more inclusive culture. So use this time of focus from everyone to start to talk about that broader initiative or DNI. Great. Another question was, I'm interested in learning more about how DEI strategy is being impacted by the marches and protests across the region and the nation. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we, uh, and this is not a monolith, so uh, every organization I don't think has had the same wrestle or struggle. I think traditionally diversity and inclusion, um, in some ways, although it was an output of things that we saw related to racism, injustice, inequity, those pieces, 
that had left the conversation largely. And it sort of got into these more palatable things around diversity, inclusion, um, unconscious bias, all those things which are really important, but it sort of forgot the historic precedent that led up to this moment. Um, so what, what, what's starting to happen now is we're swaying back to like, oh yeah, we moved up into this diversity and inclusion conversation, but we really never handled the historic racism, injustices, and inequities that led us to needing diversity and inclusion and affirmative action and all those things in the first place. Uh, so there's almost this backtracking and um, openness of organizations addressing social impact issues that they would typically not address, right? Like to have CEOs stand up and say Black Lives Matter, um, you just really, really, it was, you saw Ben and Jerry's do it, right? But large majority of organizations would be uncomfortable saying anything to the like um, for fear of a multitude of reasons, right? They didn't want it to feel like pandering. They also were feared of um, getting backlash from their customer base and all those other spaces around it. So we're going back to say, okay, what are the, the inequities that exist? How are we really handling this big social issue of racism that is like really stubborn inside of our country that we need to solve for? And then how do we build that into our broader strategies of DEI in order to get to the outcomes that we're looking for? Great. And then the last one for you, this is uh, this is wide open. You can go wherever you want with this. <laughs> what do you see are the biggest challenges for the next year or so? Oh, um, I'll wear my hat. <laughs> like, so I don't know everyone's lives. I'm sure you all got your own challenges to deal with. Um, <laughs> but I think when we think about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think the biggest challenge is uh, one is going to be maintaining momentum. Um, so because people are hyper focused now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be hyper focused in the future. Um, I think making this lead to tangible results uh, is going to be really important. So great, uh, back to the earlier conversation, great your CEO put out a statement, glad that your senior leaders are on board, glad you don't want black people to be killed and you're against racism, right? We're all on board with that messaging, but so what, right? What are the bigger commitments that you're gonna make as an organization to move this forward? And those bigger commitments have been the things that we've traditionally stu um, struggled with inside of corporate America, getting uh, black representation on senior leadership teams and on boards. Um, breaking through and making sure that uh, things like economic mobility can happen within our communities, uh, that we see things around um, policing change. And, and our customers and our employees are going to start to push us on this and push us on what our role is, organization, what roles we're playing as organizations to, to move that needle. Um, and we're going to have to figure that out pretty quickly in pretty short order. Uh, and because the rest of the things won't feel authentic otherwise. So I think that's gonna be the big challenge for us to find, find out like, how do we make long-term sustainable change out of all of these things and what are, what's the measurable impact that we wanna have. Right. So it sounds like, if, if I'm hearing you right, we really have two separate and distinct issues we need to deal with and anti-racism, social justice being the one and then the diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging another. And it, to me, it's almost like if you don't fix the underlying anti-racism social injustice it's kind of like you're building a beautiful deck on rotted footers you know yeah uh, and you've really got to get to both of those problems before you can really move forward in a meaningful way is that would you say that's kind of accurate that was a great way of putting your key i'll frame that on my wall <laughs> <laughs> all right um that's all we've got for the questions that came in. Any uh, any in the chat room, Shelley, or anything that where we could open it up if not? Or yeah, no chats. Like... I would say feel free to take yourself off mute. Please introduce yourself and, and let's talk. Yeah. Hi, Jamil. This is Alan. I just took it upon myself to just jump in and try to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Alan. How's it going? It's going well. It's going well. I really appreciate uh, what you shared today, and I thought it was really beneficial. I think... Uh, I'm optimistic about the future, believe it or not, to be honest. And I think that a lot of things are going to get addressed that needed to be addressed and needed to be helped. Uh, I wanted to get your opinion in regards to, so in typical fashion, a lot of times, especially in the corporate world, or if you're a regular employee who has been experiencing racism 
or prejudice or just stare, falling into a stereotypical realm. People are afraid to speak up for fear of their job or more or less be known as, you know, uh, that individual that's always bringing it up because playing, they're playing the race card, et cetera, or for fear of just losing their job in general. Um, do you think there's going to be some type of legislation or some kind of like ability for employees to feel more confident in speaking out when racist things happen within the workplace? Because truth be honest, of course, racist things happen in almost every workplace, but they go essentially unaddressed because people are afraid to do like to talk about it. Um, so I'll answer the question in, in uh, a couple of ways. One, I, legislation, that's outside of my realm. So yeah, your guess yeah. is as good as mine on what gets passed through Congress in today's day and age. Um, so I don't, I don't know what will happen there. But here's what I, what I do uh, think is going to happen coming out of this. I think more employees are going to speak out, one. Um, and I think companies that don't handle that well are going to get blasted. Right, really, really quickly because everyone has a social media account, everyone has a megaphone, everyone can at you on Twitter, and everyone will retweet it really quickly. Um, so I think people will speak up more, and I think people, companies that don't handle it well, are going to get held accountable in a different fashion. What that means, though, is for us, particularly in what we think about from our processes and procedures on the HR side and the DEI side, is we need to make sure that we are prepared to give voice and listen in a different way, right? So that means reevaluating the way that we do investigations uh, and saying like, oh, traditionally I would call everyone on that leadership team and in that account and say, if no one else validated the same perspective that this one employee had, then, uh, right, we did our investigation, found no confirming evidence, we'll send you two to a mediation session so you and your manager get along better and, and then go about your way. Um, so mm -hmm. I think we're gonna to need to slow down and think about the thoroughness of those processes and the way that we give voice to our employees and listen and um, talk to our managers about how to respond to them. I think that's gonna be really critical in the coming uh, months and organizations that you're gonna to start to see changes from companies thinking about those processes differently. So hopefully there's you know legislation supporting and, and all those other spaces to support our, our team members. Uh, but even if there's not, companies are gonna to start to have to pivot. I like that. Did I answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I really did that touch upon everything. I appreciate the answer. Thank you for the question. Can always count on you, Alan, with a good question. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> Who else has questions? Got to be I some know more. There's, more. there's got to be lots more. I got another one if nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. What? Um. So another question I was gonna ask is um. It's more of opinion, but like uh, I, I, to the conversation that Keith was mentioning earlier in regards to you know the the reaction towards white privilege, and you kind of went into other privileges in regards to able body or straight privilege or privilege of being a man. I this I could be completely wrong, but sometimes is there a more visceral reaction whenever the topic of white privilege is there versus all the other ones? I know that's more of an opinion, but sometimes I feel like there's a lot of arguments pertaining towards kind of what Keith was saying, like, you know, the uh, original thought is, wait, I don't have privilege. But when you speak upon every other you know, straight privilege or being privileged or man, they're almost like accepted in the aspect of, yeah, I can see that. Versus yeah. the, wait a second, hold on, what do you mean by white privilege? Yeah, I, I think it, it's important to understand that no demographic like holds the, um, holds a monopoly on prejudice, right? Racism is a whole different issue of systemic pieces, but prejudice specifically, like that's not held by any one demographic. And there are a lot of communities that are marginalized and have to um, deal with the marginalization in a, in a different fashion. Uh, I think in today, right, if you ask today, white privilege is much more charged than those other words. If you would ask a couple of years ago around the Me Too movement, Time's Up, and you talked about male privilege and misogyny, that would have been a lot more charged. Um, you, uh, you go a few more years around that and you talk about um, before we saw Marriage Equality Act get passed and, and you talk about straight privilege, right? That was a lot more charged. And, and now we have our own challenges within the US at least around things like um, gender identity and, and trans, um, cisgender versus transgender uh, privileges that exist. So I think in each moment in time, they all carry their own sort of uh, charge and, and visceral reactions and pushbacks in those spaces. I think right now, white privilege is the 
the, the bigger obstacle just because of the current climate. Uh, mm -hmm. But that'll continue to evolve and it, all these things will continue to rotate until we get to a space where we, we kind of create equity across the board. Appreciate it. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you again for the question. Jamil, this is Maroon Klein. I have a question for you. Hey, Maroon. Hey, how you doing? Wow. Great. Listen, the, the work that frontline people do at Aramark can be pretty dangerous. And, um, you know, the food service work, janitorial service work, um, you know, other contract service work. And we don't often think about safety as a diversity issue, but it is. And it, it really is a lives matter. And it's uh, how do you encourage people to speak up when they see unsafe practices. And maybe if, if you could talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion and what you're doing at Aramark so that you really are protecting lives and giving people the courage to speak up when they see something. Yeah, and Marome, is that as it relates to general safety or are you talking about specifically as it relates to equity and inclusion? Well, really about, I mean, it starts with, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, I mean, physical safety of someone not getting hurt in the kitchen or not getting hurt with chemicals when they're, when they're, you know, doing a janitorial service contract. I mean, that's a pretty basic area to start with. And it, it is a diversity issue because some people often don't give themselves the license to speak up when they see something as much as others? Yeah. Um, so, and I'll try to answer that question the best I can. I think when you look at Aramark, the organization and our works uh, with food service, facility services, uniforms, um, you're gonna see like really intense safety protocols for a variety of reasons. One is to your point, uh, the most important thing for us is that a team member when they leaves out, leave out of our, when they come, they leave out the same way they came in, right? Like there should be no fear of how that's going to harm them physically uh, when they come for us. So you'll see all the things that we have, that we have very rigorous standards as it relates to food, food safety, handling equipment, um, the things like cutting boards, right? That you wouldn't even think about and wearing the proper gold, gold, uh, gloves and equipment when you're cutting salads or meats and, uh, and food poison, protecting from food poison and all the other pieces. So in the almost so much that everyone has to take serve safe within our organization, right? Like, so I'm serve safe. Um, I've taken my serve safe certification and you don't want me cooking anything <laughs> for you guys. So that that's up and down the company that we show that commitment for us. And in particular right now in the midst of COVID and making sure that we have people with the proper safety protocols and PPE and, and all those pieces. So that stuff is, is critical um, in, a com in a completely different way than what we see from uh, the DNI standpoint of, you're not gonna get through the door from with us unless you understand how to do those things. Now, the, the other piece that I, I think I hear you talking about is how do we create a space where people feel comfortable voicing their perspective without fear of repercussion? And then how does that impact the way that they show up every day? And I think this all goes back to this conversation around inclusion in the first place, because if I feel like I'm valued as an employee, if I feel like my manager cares about who I am as an individual, um, then I know that when I talk about my truth or what's going on or, or surface things, that that's not going to be used against me. So a lot of our work has been around training our managers around things like respect in the workplace, um, making sure that they understand bias and how that shows up when they come to work every day, um, making sure that they know how to have conversations with their team members and facilitate them and, and wherever possible that they create those small moments of connecting with one another. Uh, because the more that you can create that connection and normalize it with one another, with, between a manager and a person that uh, is working with them, the much more likely they are to speak up when they have a tense situation, safety or otherwise. So we need our managers and our employees to be real people with one another so that they can have those real conversations. Hopefully I answered your question. Too. Thank you. Yes. Hey, Jamil, it's Michael. How are you? Hey, Michael. How are you? How's it going? Hey, I was curious, and I have a specific example. Um, I was wondering, uh, I was actually kind of wondering what you thought about the NFL, and if you think that's a little bit of a situation of too little, too late, 
And to further that point, do you think that there are other companies that are in this kind of danger zone of if you haven't spoken now, um, it's going to, it's going to be too late. Yeah. Um, so the NFL is a tough one in, in particular because there's so many more layers on it than just sort of when they, they speak up, when they've spoken up. Um, I think that the one piece is that people are going to challenge you speaking up and it's not like you can just put out a statement and expect everyone to be clapping for you. Um, so that's the uncomfortable space that our companies are in. Um, and you're going to see backlash. You might see your CEO release like a really heartfelt, transparent, vulnerable statement, yelling Black Lives Matter and saying that the deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery, all that stuff is wrong. And, and you're like, yeah, this is 100% something I get, can get behind. And then someone will <laughs> retweet it on Twitter like, but you, blah, 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 as an organization. Um, and I think there's a reality of you just got to face the music and say, yes, um, I, I saw, I got a really interesting note through H&M, if you guys uh, shot with them, and they got into some trouble a couple of years ago because they had the, the sweatshirt that said coolest monkey in the gym, and they had a little black boy wearing it as part of their marketing material. Um, and they released a, a statement to all their customers saying, um, we condemn the deaths, the, the, some of the, the things that we would all recognize through other statements. Um, but what they put in there is they said, um, hey, we recognize that at H&M, we've, we've been part of the problem before. And I want to let you all know that we're committed to not doing being part of the problem and we're committing to being part of the solution. Uh, so this sort of recognizing that, hey, if historically you've done things that have added to this problem and you've been on the wrong side of this conversation before, don't try to act like that didn't happen, right? Face up to that music and say, we've been on the wrong side of this conversation. We're going to be on the right side now and then follow that up with tangible actions and results. Because at that point, people will say like, all right, you're being real about it. You can point to ways that you're making a difference. Um, if you hedge or you try to sort of sit between the fence and not make anyone mad, you're gonna make everybody mad. So it's risky. It's uncomfortable. You might lose some tradition. Some people will be mad at you either way, but you got to be firm in what you mean and what you stand for as an organization and just own it. That's my thought. So I think I'm going to have to call you offline to talk about the NFL. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jamil. It's Rachel. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Rachel? I'm doing well. Thanks. Um, I'm glad that you brought that up because I was actually really curious from your perspective about how brands are approaching it because it kind of feels a little bit like a black background, white font, we don't support this, and then moving on. Um, so I'm glad that you brought up kind of how H&M addressed it because the cancel culture seems to be pretty strong right now. Mm -hmm. um, but how would you, I mean, if you were to approach this as a brand, what would you say is an appropriate response outside of, you know, owning those, those flaws? I don't know if people should be, you know, saying I donated this or if companies should say this is our diversity. What, what is an appropriate response? Yeah, one thing that, um, great question too, Rachel. One thing that I think is really important for companies right now, you can't go to your textbook diversity and inclusion language. Like we here at Insert Company X value diversity and inclusion. And we think this is a place for all play employees to be safe and successful. True, hopefully it's true for your organizations, but if you talk about generic diversity and inclusion right now, you are going to get creamed. This is not a DNI issue. This is not a moment around diversity and inclusion. It's a moment for Black and African Americans and racism and injustice. And you need to be hyper-focused on that's what we're dealing with. Yes, it will lead to a broader conversation around DNI and inclusion and equity that will um, sort of be lifted as part of this, but you got to know that this is talking about Black Americans and you got to be sensitive to it. We saw celebrities get in trouble for that over the last week of them going to like the, the textbook language um, and like all people type of framing of it that that is missing the moment. So uh, you got to talk about the, the situation at hand. That's going to be really critical um, mm -hmm. for the brand. And then Rachel, to part two of your question, if you're not thinking about it already, you got to think about your so what. Like, so, um, post away, do Blackout Tuesday, um, National Day of Mourning, all those things. Juneteenth is coming up. I'm sure we're going to see a lot of stuff from organizations as that approaches. All those things are valuable, but you got to be part of the long-term solution if that's what you're saying. 
Right. You can't say I'm condemning systemic racism and justice and the killing of Black Americans. The end. <laughs> but I, yeah, the end. Like, I don't like it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Somebody right. Just <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got to be part of that solution. So figuring out how your company is going to be part of that solution is a really, really critical conversation. So I know we're in crisis management mode right, right now. Slow your organizations down and say what's coming on the horizon. Um, I, yeah. Some companies have been faster than others to react to that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, I guess my other question would, would be there are a couple companies who are focusing on internal messaging and not really putting out anything externally. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Do you feel like every company kind of needs to take a public stand or, you know, w what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I think it's part of, it's your organization and, you know, is your company one that speaks publicly? I, your employee, you, you very much need to be speaking to your employees. Um, generally, I would say, I would encourage organizations to be external as they can, but I know some companies, that's just not their culture to do. They don't have really robust social media channel, channels or PR departments. And um, I don't want you to leave your company identity to be something that you're not to try to, to jump on to a moment. Um, because that starts to feel inauthentic. I think regardless of whether or not you make giant, broad, um, $1 billion commitments like some organizations have done or $100 million commitments like we've seen some uh, other organizations that they're pushing through, you need to really be clear, at least with your workforce um, and your customers uh, and your clients and what you're doing to move this issue forward. So how you communicate that, I think it's a little bit around your, your company's culture. Um, be as external as you can while right. being authentic to your culture, but still being hyper, hyper focused on this is what we're doing to fix the issue. Right. And, it, and I think in some ways, um, big numbers are important. So yeah, I'd love to see $100 million towards combating injustice, right? That, that, that feels good but you can't just throw money at this problem and have it right. go away. So I think exactly who are the right partners, right? Who are the community organizations that are really going to help to make a change? Um, how is that money going to be used? How are you going to be held accountable um, as an organization and using it the right way? And um, what are the success measures that you're really uh, measuring yourself against to say that you helped to solve for, for the issue? Okay, thank you very much. I'll, I'm going to email you after this too, if that's okay. Uh, of course. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Jamil, it's Teresa. Hey, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wanted to get your thoughts on, I think this is a big question about cultural shift, but I think, you know, in having conversations over the last couple of days, especially the last week, um, there are still, I mean, these conversations need to be happening, uh, but there's also still some not, I don't want to say resistance, because that's not necessarily the right word in this case, but the mindset that, you know, work is work, and you come to work, and you do the thing, and, like, this issue of Black Lives Matter is a political issue, and so, like, I've always been, and I've heard this, like, I've been raised to keep these things separate, and I don't think it's, nece it's not necessarily that, like, desire to pull the wool down over someone's eyes, maybe it is, because it's uncomfortable, but what are some of the steps at like the initial steps that we can take to say, hey, this is not like talking about church and religion in work. This is the necessary conversation to do the work and to do it and this actually impacts. Like how do you get that ball rolling? Yeah, that's such a great question too. And I, I think um, we've been eroding against this, uh, this sentiment as a society for some time now, like this idea that you show up to work and everything except for your workday disappears the moment you walk into the office. Um, I think it's been kind of being chipped away slowly and slowly and slowly. Um, and you're hearing less about like work-life balance and it's more about work-life integration because my personal is my work and my work is my personal. And those things really are, are colliding with one another. Um, I think we need to uh, one, give guidance to leaders and employees about how to channel it and create opportunities for them to channel those conversations in safe ways. Um, so what are the support mechanisms that you have for large organizations? It might be through your employee resource groups. Um, for small organizations, it might be uh, things that you can set up with certain um, providers who can provide the right type of coaching, counseling, 
or um, therapeutic measures for your suit for your employees. Uh, for leaders, they need to understand how to listen empath empathetically um, and how to have those types of conversations and navigate those types of conversations with their team members. Uh, we teach leaders a lot around how to do the work, how to manage, how to supervise, how to, to how to direct tasks. Um, the soft skills stuff uh, outside of like the traditional coaching for professional development, right? We, we sometimes lack giving our leaders the skills and tools on how to be that type of person. So I think now as we look at our leadership development curriculum and programs, really getting into that content and saying, guys, we gotta help our leaders be empathetic, help them um, speak to employees about the real issues that they're dealing with. Right now it's racism and injustice. Um, next year, it might be an individual thing where your employee had a death in the family. You need to just know to not make them work through that time frame and send them home, right? Or how to even show your levels of condolences. Um, so I think we've done a, we can do a better job, I would say, of equipping our leaders on how to have those types of conversations so that they can really do it. Um, otherwise, we're just hoping that they were raised right. And, and that's harder. Did I answer your question? You can check them. <laughs> Thank you. I want to be respectful Thank of your time, you. Jamil. It is almost five o'clock. Are you okay to continue talking for a little while? I am, yes. Great. All right. Somebody was chiming in, I think. Hey, Jamil. It's Vicki. Hey, Vicki. I'm, I'm so happy to hey. see some familiar your faces. <laughs> <laughs> First Teresa, then me. I know. Um, hey, so, you know, I think kind of the follow on from Teresa's question. Um, we're, we're thinking a lot about the internal communications and interactions between and amongst our employees on the topics of racism and social justice and, and equity. And I'm just curious what you're hearing and seeing and experiencing around how organizations are handling those internal informal communications, right? We've got Slack, we've got everybody on Slack. You know, we've had some, um, some people posting things on Slack that um, in most cases, you know, everybody's been really uh, interested in and supportive of that. We've had a couple situations that have not been so great. Um, but, you know, that informal communication, I think, is really important, but also something that organizations have to know what, you know, what do we manage? How do we manage? And, you know, how do we do that in a way that um, it is certainly inclusive, if you want to call it that? Um, but also, you know, supports the position the organization is taking, which for us certainly is, you know, as many other organizations are taking a stand to say, we're not going to stand for this and we're going to do our part to make things better. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's such a great question too, Vicki, and one that's uh, difficult to deal with. So I'll say for us, we don't have a comprehensive internal social media network. So uh, we have things like Slack and Yammer and Facebook Workplace in pockets of our organization, but not one that we use uh, uh, in totality. Uh, there's a few things that I think are critical as part of this is um, one is you, have, you need to make sure that you've created safe spaces for people to be able to work through their emotions and their reactions um, before they voice it publicly. And that I know that's easier said than done, but making sure that there are spaces for people to talk and get guidance um, in some, preferably smaller group formats is going to be critical. Uh, because they're feeling these emotions and they're going to talk to someone. And if you haven't helped them work through them internally first, they're going to, there's a much higher likelihood that they're going to, they're going to say something off, right? Or, or something that you just wouldn't want them to say. So that, that's going to be really critical uh, for your company first to create those safe spaces. Um, and then I, you know, I think there is a, a bit of a reality of, once you said this is where we are as a company and this is what we stand for, there's an inherent risk of that. Of there might be people who don't align with those values, right? Like it's not core to who they are. And are you ready to make those tough calls for leaders or people within your company who say, I don't agree with this? Um, and your response has to be like, what? Like, are you saying that if you don't agree with this and if you're not aligned with our company values, you evaluate whether or not this is the company that you want to be associated with. Um, are you going to sort of help explain and coach them through those sentiments and feelings and try to make sure that they um, they can come out and see why it's critical for the organization. But I think it needs to be as those um, sentiments that are contrary to the stance that the company is taking are starting to emerge, getting in front of that thought process of what does this mean for how we handle it for those associate, associates. 
Uh, and it's probably a little bit different for each organization, but if, if you don't have that decision, you're gonna be sort of caught with your hand in the cookie jar of trying to make in the moment decisions about people and, and comments and disciplinary actions that you don't wanna to have to make in the moment. Right, yeah. Good, thanks. No problem. Any other questions I can answer? Yeah, Jamil, I'm going to jump in with uh, one more, and it's maybe if you could talk a little bit about diversity as a business imperative, and when you get a mix of different perspectives, different opinions, different disciplines, different ethnic backgrounds, personalities, what that does to improve innovation and decision making, and how you're fostering that. Yeah, and I think it's really critical. We, uh, we use the, the terminology interchangeably, right? So you hear diversity and inclusion all the time, almost as if it's one word. Uh, it is important to understand that those are two very different concepts and diversity is not inclusion and inclusion is not diversity. Um, when we talk about diversity, we're talking about the mix of individuals and the unique perspectives that we all bring, the differences and the similarities. Um, when we talk about inclusion, uh, it's really about how are we leveraging those unique perspectives to get to greater outcomes within our organization. Uh, so diversity doesn't lead to better outcomes without inclusion, and inclusion doesn't lead to better outcomes without diversity. And I'll explain that. If you just throw a lot of different people in a room on a team and say, be better, it's not realistic, right? It's, it's actually easier early on for me to work with people who are like me um, because we have similar thought processes. There's less tension. I know how to navigate those conversations. We might have gone to the same high school or college or grew up in the same neighborhood. Like all those things ease the process earlier on. But what it leads to is greater likelihoods of groupthink and less um, uh, a creative tension happening, maybe less likelihood for conflict within an idea because we don't have those different perspectives. So it's not about just getting diversity to lead to those better outcomes. It's about leveraging that diversity through inclusion. Um, and how do I make sure that your voice is heard, that people's opinions, that people know that their opinion is valued, um, that their perspective is valued, what they bring to the ta table has value, and how do we give um, avenues for their voices because when you have those two things together then productivity increases we see much greater outputs from um, diverse and inclusive teams than what we see from homogenous teams you guys can go on websites through corn Ferry and deloitte and towers watson they all have tons and tons of white papers and research um, that's done across this uh, you see diverse uh, leaders that are rated highly for inclusivity um, outperform teams by anywhere from like two to 10 times based on whose research you're looking at. Um, organizations that are rated for high levels of inclusion um, outperform their peers on the stock market by like two to 10 times as well. So you, you see these much greater outcomes, but it's really those two things together that lead to it. And sometimes we make the mistake of just going down the path of one or the other and don't recognize that both are necessary in order to get to the better results. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad that you added about what makes you comfortable and that the diversity, as you increase inclusion and you widen diversity, that you're probably gonna be out of your comfort zone. You're probably gonna have more conflict, more tension, more of the kind of things that HR folks get called into and go, you know, can't we just kind of smooth things over? But it really is that tension mm -hmm. that is what makes that performance, those performance improvements that you're talking about, uh, that's what makes it possible. Exactly. It's great. Yeah, there were some comments in chat. Uh, Jimmy, I'll just so you know, people had to drop off a little, but lots of great feedback. Like, thank you so much. I think one said, uh, Jamil is one of the gems of Philadelphia. So I wanted to share that with you. <laughs> so lots of really, really nice comments in there. So here's another one. Let's see. Unless anyone has a question, feel free to talk over me. Um, uh, lots, lots and lots and lots of thank yous, including from Michael. So. But I appreciate you all listening. And listen, I, I know this is a tough time. Um, for us as uh, an HR community and as a world in general, but 
um, we can drive really large, meaningful change for our organization. Um, and you'll be surprised how meaningful a conversation, a, a forum, a check-in with your employees will be during this time frame. So I know some of us are nervous of saying, we sort of err towards saying nothing because we're afraid to say the wrong thing. Um, but I don't know that that's the posture we need to take right now. Um, I think speaking up is going to be critical for your companies. Thank you. All right. All right. That's a wrap. That's it. So I want to yeah. acknowledge you guys. It, the, the Aramark has been doing heroic work through all of this. I mean, we want to talk about people on the front lines that are really putting it on the line at this time. You, you guys are just awesome. Just absolutely awesome what you're doing. Thank you. And you like it. And it's not me, right? It's our, our frontline team members that are out there serving meals and nurses and doctors and their cleaning facilities so that people can show up and, and making sure that people's uniforms mm -hmm. are safe. So uh, we really have some heroes on the front line and I couldn't be more grateful for what they do every day. Yeah. Jamil, thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining. This has been a really great hour and, and six minutes, whatever it was, but thank you so much. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Took a lot of notes. I'm sure many others did and we really appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Jamil. Thanks again. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you.